what happened. But what happened here in California was unbelievable because this nexus of irrigation, refrigeration, transportation, immigration, suddenly, for the first time in the history of the world, in the deepest winter of Montana, you could get a lemon or a lime or an avocado. For those of us old enough to remember who heard, or who's heard stories from our parents about the, the orange in the holiday stocking, you know, that this was the great gift from somebody who happened to go to Florida and could get it back to you in time for you to still enjoy it. Suddenly the notion that you could get fresh produce in the middle of winter year, I mean year round access, again, a miracle. So the question becomes, okay, let's flash forward to today where it's clearly gotten away from us. You know, we've gotten to the point where in the turn of the last century, the three leading causes of death were all linked to malnutrition. And now the three leading causes of death are all linked to overeating. So we've gone this wild extreme to a very short lifestyle, a very short lifespan definitely tethered to the food we ate to, again, a shortened lifespan tethered to the food we eat. So how do we rescue ourselves to a certain extent? And make no mistake, this is where you do start to get some, I won't say villains, you know, that's too, that's too provocative a word. But I think one of the things that escaped us was, particularly after World War II, when we had in effect, in effect fought a war on two fronts, the notion that American businesses would put wealth ahead of health just seemed impossible. I don't think people really anticipated that there would be this moment in which there would clearly be a, a, a demarcation from the traditional norms in which suddenly people would sell food that wasn't healthy. Uh, and actually, and then you had the birth of modern advertising, of which I am a child of. I grew up, by the way, in Chula Vista, was one of many places I grew up as a kid. My father was in the Marines back there, back then born in Ashtabula, Ohio, and suddenly he and his young wife end up in Capistrano Beach, and he's flying jets, um, and he has a first son, Juan. Um, and it was a great time growing up here in Southern California, and it was funny because I moved to D.C. and ran nightclubs for the longest time. And this is very germane to our discussion because if I have successes, a lot of it is time and place. I opened the DC Central Kitchen at the advent of both cable television and um, the internet, which gave me a glorious stage right below the capital of the United States to, enter, to, to give people an eyeful of a new idea. But it was never just about food. And this is really important to our conversation because what we're talking about, we have a superior product. In the marketplace, what we're talking about is a superior product. It's local, it's healthy, it's fresh, and it builds the economy. Everything you think would, be, would make us at the very forefront of a new American economy, yet we're still struggling to sell our product. You know, the, the USDA has a budget of about $16 million to sell the food pyramid, as flawed as it is. We're competing with McDonald's that has almost $100 million in advertising. That's what we're going up against. It's very difficult, but what we're doing is selling a new product. And I think sometimes, historically, um, I was talking with a friend who I'll bring up later or mention later, but we were talking about if somebody, if you have a great product but no one's buying it, don't blame the customer, look at the product. And I think we've assumed historically that because what we're doing is right and smart and good that it will be, people will buy it, not necessarily. So. The question becomes, what do we need to build? How do we need to sell it? Who are our customers? And this is a lot of where I live. Um, again, I ran nightclubs, and I, I ran nightclubs because I was very, very convinced at a very early age that I wanted to be involved in maintaining the vision that, as a 10-year-old, I watched momentarily derailed by the assassinations of Dr. King and Robert Kennedy. I was nine, turning 10, here in June 1968, um, and to my young eyes, those two young men were speaking about an America I wanted to be part of. This idea of what, could we, what would it be like if as a country we could move beyond race, gender, class, um, and find common ground and work together. To a 10-year-old, it was like, sign me up. And I really, very early age, decided that's what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and I told this story earlier, and I'll make it brief, but I saw, um, I, I saw my parents have a, my parents had a party in which their friends who had argued incessantly about politics of the day, and the politics of today are no different than they were then. It was a very, America was divided. Yet my parents and their friends who could not agree on the politics of the day or the message of Dr. King and Robert Kennedy, they had a party and they put on a Motown record and everybody danced. And it was Eureka. 
you know, the power of music. Because the same, the lyrics to those songs were saying the identical same thing that Robert Kennedy and Dr. King were saying, and it was causing so much political anguish. Put to music, people would accept it. They would listen. They would open up where they would normally say, I don't want to talk about that. Suddenly, they would not just open up, they would dance. And that interested me. You know, how can you keep new ideas going? And I discovered the Trojan horse that is music. And I've dealt in Trojan horses all my life. I build Trojan horses. Never forget, the siege of Troy was not a three-day weekend romp. It was a 10-year siege. And you could make a case that every single day of those 10 years, the Greeks were the aggrieved party and were right. Paris went to dinner and had home, uh, dinner in another man's home, split with his wife. So the Greeks had every right to be pissed off. But they were pissed off outside the gates. And it took a younger person, which is why I'm so honored to be introduced and to have spent some time with the Food Justice Fellows. It took a younger person, Odysseus, to come along and say after 10 years, let me try the same stuff you've been using for 10 years in the traditional way. Agamemnon the king did nothing wrong, he just followed tradition. It took a younger person with fresh eyes to see the wood that they were using for 10 years could be used a different way. And the next morning they were in the gates and it was the Trojans' idea to let him in. That's to me, I just want to create a Trojan horse out of food.